Hi everyone, I'm Sabina. Today I have a special guest for my channel, my dear friend, Natalie. Hello everyone, <laughs> nice to see you all on this channel. So today I'm gonna ask her about her life as Kyoto. Natalie, thank you so much for joining me today. So my first question is, where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> Such a big secret, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Sabina, for inviting me. So I came from Uzbekistan. I'm a Korean. So I came from Uzbekistan nine years ago because I got scholarship from Korean government for overseas Korean. So did you come here for your master's, bachelor's, or for master's, master's first? Yeah. Is that Okay, if I ask what major? Yeah, sure. I was majoring in hospitality management for my master's, and then I got one more scholarship. So I entered Kamhi and was doing PhD for business administration. Oh, wow. So did you finish PhD as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just listened all the classes. Yeah, understood that. Probably I don't want to become a professor or a researcher, and in the, this kind of analysis, making hypotheses is not really what I want to do in the future. So I decided to do something other. Like I started some business here and this is how my PhD pass finished <laughs> at this point. Yeah. I understand, I understand. Same. Because yeah, I've been doing my master's and I'm like, no, I can't be a researcher. <laughs> I'm like, why did I start? Why, why did I, I start it? Yeah. Anyways. So you're from Uzbekistan. Which language do you speak? So my mother tongue is Russian language. This is like pretty common language in Uzbekistan, especially if you live in Tashkent, which is capital of Uzbekistan. And Korean is my foreign language. Mm. We didn't speak Korean at home, so I'm ethnic Korean, which people usually call Koreoin, which means usually Russian speaking Korean from CIS countries. And most of Koreoins, unfortunately, maybe 99 or something around that percent don't speak Korean unfortunately. Maybe they speak sometimes some Korean but like some words I would say. Most of us speak Russian as a native. Uh, we don't have the same word by the way in Russian language. So Korean people basically were forced to move to Russian territory in the early 20th century under the Stalin administration. So, so Korean have a long history. So are you the third generation of Korean? Officially, I'm a third generation of Koreans who grew up in Uzbekistan. But before that, I think about two generations lived in the Far East, which is Vladivostok these days. And then, if I'm not mistaken, 1938, Koreans were repressed to Uzbekistan. Mm. I know that most of them were repressed to Uzbekistan's territory, which is these days called Karakalpakstan. It's a desert, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> some of them were repressed, like very big part also was Kazakhstan. And some of them also just much more less of people were repressed to Kyrgyzstan or some other countries. But majority Majority was sent to Uzbekistan. Mm, so that's why there's a large number of Koreans in yeah, Uzbekistan. Right. I see. Can I ask what Karapakstan is? <laughs> <laughs> Karapakstan is country inside Uzbekistan. So we have one country inside Uzbekistan, but only one. For example, in Russia, there are very many countries inside mm -hmm. Russia, like many republics as far as I know. In Uzbekistan, only one. Mm. It's pretty much, I mean, culture is very pretty much similar, I would say, with Kazakhstan. Not the same, but still pretty much similar. But yeah, we have this country inside Uzbekistan. Mm. And many of Koreans, they moved to like capital or outside of the country. And usually people you see these days, even they live, for example, in Russia these days or some other countries, if they're Koreans, if you ask them, probably if their parents or grandparents started their past from Uzbekistan. Yeah. I see. You just told me you didn't speak Korean with your family. Yes. So how did you learn Korean? You came to Korea without knowing Korean? I knew some Korean because I started to learn Korean before coming to Korea, oh. like for getting a scholarship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I still required usually like a level three 
this which is low intermediate level for getting a scholarship at least in my country so this is like was minimal requirement oh, wow. <laughs> yeah so i got just minimal requirement at the time and came here and after that i started korean already here in korea mm. how's your life in korea oh it's just I... a very ambiguous question <laughs> i would say it's pretty much comfortable mm. like very safe because I, i i have been living here in korea for nine years you just get used to living here a lot like at the beginning you feel like very much for you i would say then you have some ups and downs but still you're like kind of feel very comfortable i like many things in korea pretty much yeah maybe weather could be better yeah <laughs> but yeah <laughs> but but generally like korea mm. a lot my second motherland i would say yeah. mm. were there any struggles when you started living in korea yeah sure i still like struggled with korean language a lot because mm. it was just minimum like, requirement i i didn't understand many things but just came also i came I remember to Korea with four hundred dollars in my pocket. Yeah, and my parents at the beginning they didn't want me to come to Korea. Mm. I remember like they kind of were against me to come here when I started to learn Korean. They didn't really much support me, but I was pretty stubborn, so <laughs> I was able to get scholarship and come here. But I was lucky that my brother he already lived here mm. and he supported me a lot at the time. It would be very difficult to still you know survive at the beginning with four hundred dollars. I remember it because you also. To know right when you come to korea there are kind of different conditions one of them if you come to korea and you can submit documents from here to different universities but when you submit documents every time you have to like pay 150 dollars about this mm. this might be was the most difficult part for me at the time because i wasn't financially prepared still yeah there are always some chances coming to learn how to survive how to be more flexible <laughs> and this is how you're getting more i don't know wise and fast and <laughs> mm. this was a good experience i would say did your parents not want you to study in korea yeah why because i'm a girl and i think in korean families and not only korean especially muslim <laughs> <laughs> families but still you know my my family lived in in i yeah, right in the muslim country there's pretty much limitations and rules for girls which are different for example if guy he studies abroad it's okay girl it's too dangerous it's better to be here just be safe like don't go outside don't go abroad <laughs> kind of this point of view i think it's connected to this just some fears i see how about your brother so did your parents want your brother to go to korea or they're not really much excited about that but still he was still also stubborn still he's a guy i remember he hesitated as well a bit too because it was his second education second bachelor degree that's why he hesitated a bit whether he still should go to korea or not but he already got full scholarship and i think as far as i know it was maybe the best decision of his life mm. And sex to this uh, factor that he came to Korea and my parents already knew at least he's here, he would help me even I come. That's why they wasn't said so much against me to come to Korea. Because I was also very stubborn, I was studying, getting scholarship already, just going to my goal, right? <laughs> already right before me coming, they started to support me. I mm. think. Sometimes it's happened actually, yeah. Maybe a uh, fortune is checking how much you really want to get the goal. And it's normal, I think, pretty often parents would not support you or friends at the beginning. You need to prove that you really want to get this. And usually when you're ready to start to get some results, it's like when it becomes a turning point and people around you start to support you. If you want to get something, you just need to go for it. That was such amazing <laughs> advice. Do you have any stories while learning Korean? Maybe I should change the question. Do you have any um, awkward situations? Yeah, awkward um, situations. Million of them, yeah. <laughs> I would say. Sometimes, like, you want to make compliment. For example, a guy did some good job and you want to say, Moshisa, like, Moshita, like, good job, right? But you sometimes, by mistake, say, Mashita. Like, you know, like. <laughs> The guy could be pretty much surprised. It's like, especially he might be perceived like sexual contacts. Or oh, yeah, <laughs> like, right, right, right. And I have a lot of them because when you know Russian, usually you pretty often change O into A. 
in Russian. Is it gender related stuff or? No, just how you like this is a rule of pronouncing the word. It's just in Russian, it's pretty common. Like you, can you write. Can you give an example? For example, you write Korova, but you pronounce Karova. You just change automatically O into A. And that's why, like, I was, I had pretty much difficult time with, like, remembering how to pronounce O, o or A. Uh. Uh. I forgot the words. Also, I remember, like, I was going to say some compliment to a guy. Probably I was on the date. <laughs> <laughs> By mistake, because I learned the word not correctly. I finally called him impotent mm -hmm. in Korean. <laughs> like, he was like a very surprised. <laughs> you need to learn Korean properly. So. <laughs> I'm making oh these God. mistakes. That happens like for me, for example. I'm confused with Chojang and Chajong. Chojang is the. Oh my gosh, I'm confused. Chojang is to store or to save something, and Chajong means midnight, if I'm correct. <laughs> it was during COVID pandemic. You know, in Korea, there was COVID Corona Jungyongso, Corona Test Certificate. Yeah, and I wanted to ask the staff whether the document certificate was valid until 12 o'clock. And then I was like, 이거 저장까지 쓸수 있어요? Mm. I was supposed to say, 이거 자전까지 쓸수 있는지 그렇게 질문을 했어야 되는데. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had like so many stupid situations while while I was living in Korea. So I was, so was like kind of normal. <laughs> <laughs> That's normal for us. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like, oh, maybe I should have a look like not Korean. So like they originally know that I'm gonna make mistake here. <laughs> oh How are Korean people perceived in CIS countries or in Uzbekistan? Since I have been living only in Uzbekistan for a pretty long time, I would say about this maybe more at least. I, I would say it really depends on the country. For example, in my country, there are many Koreans and people really got used to us and I think people are really friendly. I really love my neighbors and neighborhood where I have lived. As I said, Koreans back in the past when they were repressed to Uzbekistan, they were just left on the desert. And local people were the ones who helped them a lot, provided some clothes or food or something else, still nice. they helped a lot. I would say they're general very kind and really nice, very friendly. I really like Uzbek people, to be honest. There are some maybe still kind of negative points when sometimes they call you like, or a dog eater or something else. But I Wait, didn't dog, really. Sorry, dog eater? I, yeah, I kind of. Oh. Yeah, there are some like stupid keys or something. They sometimes did it like when mm. they we were young. But people who are more educated, who are like, who still you communicate with, they are really open, really nice. For example, most of my neighbors are Uzbek people. Last year, when I came back to Uzbekistan for several months, I remembered I bought some sweets from Korea to. I bought some cake mm -hmm. back in Uzbekistan and I went to see them. And they were so glad to see me actually. And next day, I remember I was sitting at home and somebody knocked at the door. I opened it, this was my neighbor. And they're like, oh, daughter, let's go to eat at our house. We cook some plof. It was so nice. I was like sitting there in the neighbors and they were like, we are already 10 people in the house. It's not difficult for us to cook for one more person. Just come every day and eat with us don't buy any food oh my like, god it was uh, so amazing it's only here in my ho hometown i could experience this of course i didn't do it but it was so great to hear Aww. that's why i really love Uzbek people because i experienced so much of kindness from them and i think it really depends on where you live for example in my country i would say there are many koreans people really got used to them and many of them trust them a lot because uh, they all had a chance to communicate a lot but maybe if you live in some territory where there's not many koreans they might perceive you differently mm. i heard that in russia sometimes they had much different experience and Russia is so big, right? Mm -hmm. In my case, it was really generally nice experience and mostly, at least what I remember. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Wow, that's so sweet of them. They're yeah. so nice and kind. Yeah, I would say, uh, yeah, I'm lucky <laughs> to experience mm. this, yeah. In Uzbekistan, do they speak Russian more or do they also speak Uzbek? Actually, the, the native original language in Uzbekistan and only official one is Uzbek language. 
but back at the time when I lived in Uzbekistan, even 10 years ago, I lived in the capital. It was almost impossible to kind of survive in the capital back at the time without knowing Russian, like 20 years ago. Kind of was difficult to survive without Russian because most of the official documents still left from Soviet Union time. Mm -hmm. Most of the advertisement back then was in Russian. People still communicated all in Russian. But these days, for example, last year when I went back to Uzbekistan for some several months, I could see that many people already forgetting Russian. Unfortunately, mm. <laughs> maybe fortunately, unfortunately, yeah. But I could see this happening. So, how do you communicate with each other if you don't know so, common language? <laughs> so, common it's, language is Russian. It's kind of difficult sometimes because, unfortunately, I don't speak Uzbek language. It's really unfortunate, kind of sad. I remember several times I called taxi. But several times, like taxi drivers came and they didn't understand any Russian. And that was pretty much a bit complicated. But still, you just sit down and like enjoy your time, like uh, speechless time too. <laughs> wow, <laughs> yeah. that's so interesting. <laughs> I assume your parents also, like grandparents and parents, spoke Russian, mm -hmm. basically, and not Uzbek. Grandparents, it depends on the side. For example, father's side they spoke mostly Korean language. Yeah. But it wasn't good Korean, to be honest. When I listen to grandmother's generation's Korean, they say several Russian language like words and the and like kanda, hetta. Oh, so you <laughs> they mix Russian and Korean. Yeah, many of them, especially these days. When I heard 80 years old people, they mix. There's almost no Korean. They kind of pretend that they speak Korean, but when you listen, like there are three words in Russian, and, like one in Korean. Back at the time, I didn't understand what they said. But these days, I understand there's usual like kanda, hetta, like mm. <laughs> some basic <laughs> verbs. Yeah. Have you ever talked with grandpa in Korean? Oh, not really. I remember just he called me sometimes mudori. It means pabo. <laughs> <laughs> so your grandparents knew Korean. They yeah, Korean. some Korean. Yeah. They spoke some Korean to each other, I remember, yeah. But because we didn't speak Korean, for example, my mom didn't speak good Korean, you know, my dad even, or two, they probably had to speak some Russian. Your parents grew up without knowing Korean, or did they know? A Just bit? some words. Usually the vocabulary limits the, the name of dishes. Basic, uh, very basic. Maybe the vocabulary is like 200 words or something. My mom could understand maybe a bit of Korean, but really couldn't speak. But she studied it in the Korean language class, like when she was more than 40. And my dad, he also maybe understood just some Korean, but very limited Korean. Even like now he's 60, he still cannot read any Hangul. Mm. Yeah, he doesn't know any alphabet. See. My mom didn't know it, but she went to Korean language school when she was Sashipte. Wow, that's amazing. I don't think it's not easy to learn the language mm. after you grow up. Oh, and and you can true. learn, you can learn, of course, but I feel like I think it's amazing because many people just don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> this is the key. Right, yeah. right. I just thought it's a little similar to Cheiljopo because I feel like in my generation, many people don't speak Korean or many people just grow up without learning Korean or they even hide their Korean identity. How many percent of people do you think speak Korean? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm the third generation of Cheiljopo. I went to Hanin Hakyo. I mean, middle school and high school for Korean people. That's how I learned how to speak or write or mm. like Korean. And most people just go to normal Japanese school. I would say more than 50% of Cheiljopo don't speak mm. Korean. I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm just guessing. So not many. I see. It's pretty sad too. Yeah. Mm. Or maybe they know a little bit of it, like a little bit of Korean. I don't know. I feel like they just think mm. like learning Korean is not necessary. I see.